or appreciation for someone or something is most strongly associated with mental health. It's a key factor in fortifying ourselves during those tough times when we are in emotional upheaval or experiencing adversity of some kind or another. Gratitude has the power to give us a more optimistic look, increase our self-esteem, heighten energy levels, improve our emotional and academic intelligence, decrease stress and anxiety. We might be feeling and improve our level of self-care. With all this in mind, and knowing that these talks are tied to our November issue of success, November being the month of Thanksgiving for those of us in the United States, of course, we decided to focus on the theme of gratitude this month. We asked a few people to join us from this month's issue of the magazine, and then we reached out to a few more who could speak to the power of gratitude as well. Ready? Okay, let's get started. My name is Shelby Skirhawk with Success.com, and I'm co-host of the podcast Success Insider. And I am thrilled to be on set here with Scooter Braun for the Success Magazine cover shoot for November 2017. So if you don't know the name Scooter Braun, then I'm sure you know the personalities that he's worked with. Names such as Usher, Kanye West, uh, Ariana Grande, and of course, Justin Bieber. So while their stories are fascinating, we're here to talk to the quiet force behind them. Scooter Scott began his journey as a 19-year-old club promoter in Atlanta, and he's grown since to become the owner of SB Projects, one of the entertainment industry's most powerful talent management companies. Scooter is one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business. And now he's on the cover of the November 2017 issue of Success. Thank you so much, Scott, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Scott or Scooter? Um, you can call me Scooter. I guess my wife calls me Scott, and I feel like I'm in trouble a lot. <laughs> All right, well, we're trying not to get you in trouble here. So I started us off with a kind of laundry list of accomplishments, but it really started with a moment that you didn't hesitate, and that was when you promised to have 800 people show up to a club, and it really kind of spiraled from there. Like. Talk about that experience. Like, why didn't you hesitate? What gave you the confidence to just dive in? One, I appreciate you doing your research because most people, when they talk to me about stuff, don't know anything about that first nightclub. Um, what you're referencing is I was in Atlanta, Georgia. I was a freshman in college. Um, a lot of kids had you know, access to go out and money to go out, and um, I just didn't have capital to do that. So I liked going out and having fun, and I went by a nightclub called Chaos. And I said, look, if I brought some people here next week, would you give me some money? And the guy looked at me and he said, yeah, sure. How many people can you bring? I said, well, how many people do you hold? He said about 800. And I said, yeah, I could probably do that. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, the answer is uh, pretty much it goes for a lot of my career. I was too stupid to know that it was unreasonable. Uh, I was too naive to understand that it was unreasonable. So that always worked in my favor because the idea of losing, you know, the way my father and mother raised me, it was just kind of like, okay, you lose, you get up in the morning, you try again. And I didn't really think that I couldn't do it. And I went out and went to Kinko's, made a bunch of flyers and kind of uh, went and just started emailing people like crazy and hired a bunch of girls that I knew to go out and fly to the campus with me. And next thing you know, we had 900 people standing outside of that nightclub the following Thursday. And that kind of started that whole process. But, you know, I think a lot of it is really, really hard work. Um, but I also think a lot of it was luck. I have a lot of friends who work really, really hard and it hasn't happened for them. And I think I'm just very blessed and fortunate that a lot of things have gone my way in my career. Um, and I'm not naive to the fact that that could stop tomorrow. So I kind of never let it get, you know, blow my head too much. I had a moment when I was 19 or 20 where it started going that direction. And a really close friend of mine told me I was an asshole. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just kind of always look at everything as a blessing. And if, if it's going my way, it's probably not just for me. And I should probably figure out ways to kind of share it. So a lot of your success depends on the early discovery of artists. Um, your most famous is Justin Bieber. What did you see in him and other artists that you've discovered? And why did you trust that your instinct was right? 
Um, first of all, what I saw was kind of a hole in the marketplace where I thought something was needed uh, for Justin specifically at the time. I, I was a big Michael Jackson fan, and I, I saw a lot of kids' music doing very, very well, but I felt like it wasn't good enough that adults would want to listen to it. And when the Jackson 5 was around, they made really angelic songs that reminded adults of when they believed in love before they got all jaded. And I, I thought he was capable of that when I saw him sing. I thought he could sing with soul. And I thought there was a huge space in the marketplace. And I saw very clearly from day one how to make him the biggest artist in the world. And I became obsessed with kind of getting to him because I just knew it. Um, with Asher, it was a hole in the marketplace, same thing. And Asher taught me an important lesson of, um, you know, not every artist wants what you want. And you got to let them go on their own journey as well. Uh, but the main thing that made me kind of think that my gut was right was because that I didn't care if it was wrong. Because I'm a firm believer that if you, if you live your life by data completely, um, then you'll only do the reasonable thing. You know, you'll only kind of follow the status quo because the data will always point you to what's always been there. And if you're going to do something extraordinary, usually it's the unreasonable thing that becomes extraordinary. And I didn't have anything to lose. I didn't have kids. You know, I didn't, I didn't have anyone re relying on me. So if I had to go hungry for six days, I, I was ready to kind of take that on and handle that. Um, and if I was wrong, then I felt okay with it because at least I tried. So clearly you've got an eye for talent. Is that something that's, that's easy for you? I mean, to be able to look at something and see below the surface? Um, I, I just think that I'm pretty ordinary. I think that you know, a lot of artists are extraordinary, so sometimes it's hard for them. They'll make extraordinary stuff, but the consumer, for the most part, is like me. They're pretty ordinary. Mm -hmm. So I think my gift is when I feel like I react to something, I kind of assume that millions of other people will too because I'm, I'm pretty normal. You know, and I don't really find myself to be that extraordinary. I think I just have, you know, I have a opportunity and to kind of use the tools that were given to me to kind of help extraordinary people get seen. And I, I really, it's wild. Like even being here, I think it's crazy because I still feel like the 19 year old kid in Atlanta with an idea that I'm trying to force down people's throats. So to be here and doing a cover and, you know, having this conversation, I just feel very, very lucky. And I hope that I say, you know, a couple smart things that make people actually believe uh, I might know what the hell I'm talking about. Right. So this this idea of not being afraid, um, you didn't have anything to lose, so you weren't afraid to fail. That does take a little bit of, of confidence uh, to realize that whatever happens, whatever the very bottom, the, ever, the, the utmost failure that could happen here, I'm gonna get back up and I'm gonna be okay and I'm gonna keep going from there. Was that something that your parents taught you? Um, I think so, but look, I think at this point in my life, the one thing I've, when I do talks, the thing that usually shocks people is when I talk about my vulnerability. And I think it's actually the best thing I can share with people because then it helps them kind of deal with their own life. Even with all the success I've had at a young age, I still have nights where I'm up all night almost in tears because I'm scared and I feel like I got to make something happen. And, you know, I'm beating myself up, yet I'm very self-aware that I can't, that I don't have to, that I'm in a financial place in my life where I'm going to be okay, but I'm still beating myself up like I'm broke. And, you know, when you ask about kind of where that no fear came from, being very vulnerable, being honest with you, there was a point in my life where I was under a lot of pressure as a teenager because everyone had these huge expectations for me. And um, I remember I was at this place, it's hard to describe, but basically it was three stories and the window was open. And I remember walking over and I thought about jumping out the window. And I didn't want to kill myself, I just wanted all the pressure and the voices in my head to go away. And I ended up walking away from that window, but I came close, I never forgot it. That was probably the lowest point in my life. And I remember a week later, I had something happen where I was happy. And I realized only a week ago, I was so depressed that I almost jumped out of a window and now I'm happy and that's life. And I just promised myself I would never go to those extremes again. And so that actually, that moment kind of gave me the confidence to realize that that's, what, that's the worst it's gonna be. You know, and part of the thing that makes me kind of have less fear now is the fact that I've embraced the fact that things end. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I've had an amazing run in my career. It could end tomorrow. You know, I have, I've have artists that like love me and, and I love them and, but they could call me tomorrow and say, I don't want to work with you. You know, I, I, I've embraced the fact that one day I might get screwed. Um, and if that day comes and artists that I've had incredible runs with, they just break my heart one day. You know what? I still got to do stuff that was actually really incredible. And when that day comes, I'll deal with it until then. I'll be grateful for today. I'm glad you bring up vulnerability because that's something that we all struggle with. How do you, how do you deal with that? And vulnerability in the sense that you've got a facade that you're successful, you've got it all together, you, you, you make the right decisions. But if inside you still have that little bit of, of fear, yeah, fear and, and doubt that am I making the right decision? Like, so how do you overcome that? Um, I think you commit, you trust your gut and you commit and fear is a good thing. Fear, fear makes you think it doesn't make you complacent. It, it kind of pushes you. I can tell you with the one love Manchester event, I had complete conviction in that idea. And I was very fortunate. I said the idea. And then two days later, Ariana, rightfully so that was a big thing to ask of someone. And at the time she couldn't continue with the tour. And two days later, she called me and said, I've been thinking about it. If I don't do something, these kids died in vain let's do your idea. And we had a lot of work to do. And the day before the concert, we were in London rehearsing and the London attack happens. And I'm up that entire night driving in a car back to Manchester in the middle of the night as we're getting more information from the London Bridge and what happened. And I'm thinking to myself for the first time, am I making the right decision? You know, am I putting 55,000 people in harm's way? Like, is my brashness and, you know, resolve going to hurt people? And you start to have doubts, but then I kind of, you sit back and you realize there, there is a chance that's going to happen. But the whole reason we're doing this is because we need to make a statement that it could happen tomorrow. It could happen the next day. It could happen three months from now, but we need to keep living. We need to set that example and you need to kind of trust that, you know, your decisions are the right one and you're not going to be right every single time. I'd rather feel failure uh, and get a chance of success than feel nothing. That's interesting, yeah. So uh, let's talk about your view on failure. So I, I, I read your mission statement on the site. It says, so many of us go through life scared, scared of the unknown that is to come. Our goal is to create an environment where fear and failure are nothing more than rest stops on the road to success. We want to motivate people to find their path to purpose and execute on it. So have you always had this, this notion of, of failure and that it's just a step in the path to success? I don't think always. I think I discovered that along my own journey. That statement is kind of a culmination of a lot of things, you know, the journey you go on. You know, I named my holding company that owns SB Projects Ithaca because my favorite poem, other than Rudyard Kipling's If, is this poem um, called Ithaca, this old Greek poem. And it talks about setting out on a journey to this island of Ithaca. It's a Greek island. And it says that along the way, you'll find all these different things. And when you finally reach Ithaca, if you find her poor, she will not have deceived you because it was always about the journey. And I think that's life. You know, it, it's people want to find an ending. There isn't an ending. You're never going to be truly happy. You're never going to be truly sad if you just continue. That's just life. You get a journey, you get one ride at this thing, and then when it's over, it's over. And... I never really had the f full sense of purpose until I had my kids. And I wrote that before I had kids. And now I have an even more sense of purpose, the fact that like, as long as I instill things in them, I'll get a chance to continue. Because in 100 years, my mentor said this to me, in 100 years, no one's going to remember me, so they sure as hell won't remember you. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and I actually agree with that. No one's going to remember me, but they might feel my impact. And the truth is, I'll be dead, so what do I care? Right. You know, so try to do a positive thing. And if you're really caring about people knowing who you are in 100 years, you have a really narcissistic, weird view of the <laughs> world because no one really is going to care. Like, and you're dead. What? Like, right. you're dead. Right. Get over yourself. <laughs> are you a pretty avid reader? Um, depending on the week. Yeah. It's a weird thing. I consume a lot. Um, I wish I read books more because when I actually do get to read books, I'll like go on a little tangent where I'll read a bunch of different books. Yeah. Um, but I'm constantly consuming. I read a lot of articles. Um, and I like to watch documentaries. Yeah. Yeah. So you're 
definitely curious and, and always looking for knowledge. And I'm not complacent and I'm restless and I'm a weirdo because if I died tomorrow and all those things that you said were the end of my life, I'd be pretty pissed off. <laughs> really? Yeah, because I'm 36 and I just feel like I'm getting started hmm. and I don't want this to be it. I would like this to just be like a chapter one. So like I, that is my biggest fear. My biggest fear is like I, I need to surpass this moment because I'm not ready for it to be done. Right. In some of your your accomplishments, I know that the 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 drive, the push to keep going. So you achieve a goal and then you set another goal. You achieve a goal, you set another goal. What gives you the the gumption then? You started to allude to it, but the fact that that you're never happy with with what you've already accomplished that you want to keep doing more. So where do you draw that inspiration from to to I think I'm sick. Really? I really think I'm sick in the head. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think a part of me has a real problem because I don't get joy from just like it's a weird thing cuz I'm a homebody and I like being alone, but then I'm a super social and kind of like over the top sometimes. Um, but the real truth is, is that if, if you and I went and saw a movie, a comedy, it could be something really funny and I'll look to you to make sure you're laughing. Yeah. Like I, I, I liked other people getting joy. Like I think that's why I was, you know, good at being a party promoter. I didn't do drugs. I didn't like care about, you know, chasing girls. Like I would do that without being a club promoter, not the drugs part. Right. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I really get joy out of kind of everyone else joining in. Like I, I say to my wife, like we go on vacations, I want to like bring people mm -hmm. and I like doing game nights, you know? And um, so when you finish something, there's so many other people out there. There's like, it's also hard for me when I go out in public because my wife like thinks it's funny because like if we go on a very public place, like I'm just so fascinated because I'm staring at people. I'm like, what's your story? What's your story? What's your, like, I want to know who everyone is. Like there's a guy behind the camera right now. He's got sunglasses on, right? He's hanging out with there. I'm super curious. He's got these interesting tattoos. I'm like, what is that dude's deal? Right. Like, where is he from? Like, what's like, what's his backstory? <laughs> like, it's, but that's the way I've always been. So kind of with my own journey of like pushing it, I've never really chased money. I kind of chase ideas and chase adventure. Um, and when one's done, it's like when you were a kid, you'd finish a video game and you'd be like, ah, it's been all that time and now it's finished. Like, I need something else. So I kind of... I need to consume and I need to kind of chase and I need to, that's why I like doing some extreme sports and I, I like to have fun. And I just think that it's really, really nice when you get to a point of achievements where people want to celebrate your achievements, but that also sucks because that means no one's insulting you or telling you you're a rookie or telling you, you can't do anything anymore. And then what are you supposed to do? So does there have to be a balance though between this constant yearning for, for, more, not more financial success or, or that sort of thing, but just more ideas, more growth, more, more projects. Is there a balance between that and being able to enjoy your success and resting a little bit on your laurels to spend time with, with your family? I think people need to decide that for themselves. Um, I think there's people in history that we admire so much that weren't great family people and they transformed our society and we admire everything that they've done. Um, I just don't personally want that. You know, I'm not saying that isn't a life fulfilled. Maybe that's what they wanted. I personally have come to terms with the fact that I might be able to achieve all my goals in life. Or there's a chance that one of my interns asked me, he said, what would make you stop? And I said, if I thought I was losing my wife or my kids. And I personally want that more than I want anything. I have a tattoo from when I was uh, 20 years old. It says family, it's on my wrist. And I put it on my wrist for the reason, um, it was my only tattoo for a very long time. And the only reason uh, I put it on my wrist was because I wanted to remind myself and I have to tell this story for the rest of my life of what I'm doing it for. Because I was working so hard at such a young age, I lost sight of the fact that I wanted a family someday. I, wanted, I was doing it because I wanted to be able to provide a different life for them. And, and now I have two kids, I have the wife, and I have this success and I don't want to lose sight of that. That this is what I you know, set out for. I think it's important people write down their goals because otherwise they'll just find themselves in the rat race continuing, continuing. And it's interesting for you guys because your name's success and the definition gets 
kind of misconstrued by so many different people. You know, the happiest countries in the world aren't, well, it isn't us. Um, and, you know, Harvard put out this study talking about the longest study they've ever done. The number one correlation to long life is the quality of our relationships. So we're built to kind of interact and be with each other. I think family is the most important part of that, personally to me. Yeah. So, you know, if I have to give up certain aspects of my financial and career success to be a better dad, I'm going to choose that because that's the life I want. Um, and I think people need to choose for themselves. And I struggle with it because I'm very ambitious and I'm very competitive and I go after stuff and my wife reminds me like, okay, I understand your home, but there's a difference between being present and being present. And I'm learning that balance every single day. And, you know, I want to make sure I don't screw up because I just, to me, the most devastating thing would be to kind of grow up and be this really successful entrepreneur and have my kids think I'm a piece of shit dad. Like that would be the worst thing in the world. So I want to balance this with fatherhood and being a good husband and being a good family member. And I actually have made a conscious decision to share that with the world. And it was a hard decision because at first I was keeping it very private. But then I realized the majority of my happiness is in that. And if I'm giving an image of myself to the world that's going to last even a little bit, I want to make sure they know what it really is. And I also did it because there were so many you know, examples coming up in the entertainment industry of what this life was and success. And it was fast cars and fast women and this. And I, was, I wanted to show people that there's an alternative, that you can have all the success in the entertainment industry you want and be a really good dad and husband. Um, and I hope I'm doing that now because that's, that's one of my goals. I'm rambling now, but I'll tell you this. This is actually cool. Yeah. It's, this, is, this is something for success. This is something I would say for the magazine, for anyone watching. If, I, if you came to my office and my assistant said, we had a meeting, or you called my office and my assistant said, I'm sorry, one of his clients showed up, the very important emergencies behind closed doors, you would accept that, no problem. You'd say, that sounds normal. I couldn't understand. He's an important guy, everything else. If you came to my office and he said, hey, his son is here. He's playing with him in the room. He needs about an hour. You would actually be disappointed and feel insulted. Most people would. They'd feel absolutely insulted and be like, I don't understand. This guy's lazy. What the hell is wrong with us? Right. Like, that's crazy. So I, there are people who call this office and my assistant says, I'm sorry, he's in a closed door meeting. He's out of the office right now. Very important meeting. They'll call you back an hour. You know what I'm really doing? I've told her to put Jagger and Levi time in my schedule for an hour. And I'm playing with my kids for an hour. Because why is that not as important as taking an hour with a client? It's the whole reason I'm doing this job. So we as a society have got it all screwed up that we, we prioritize in our interactions with people and celebrate hard work, but we don't celebrate being there for our families. We claim we do, but we don't. Right. And now I've gotten to a point where I don't have time to kind of deal with your emotions towards me. So I have my assistant lie. She just says he's an important closed door meeting. Yeah. But the truth is I take an hour out every morning to spend time with my kids or in the afternoon because it's, I feel like that's just as important, it, if not more. Doesn't it suck though that you have to create that lie? That it's I not okay just to- I to think about it sucks. I just got to get it done. Right. You know, but I'm hoping that in time, you know, people, I, I understand the idea of when, 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 pe when someone's building something and I hear they're going on vacations, that annoys me. Because I'm like, you haven't built anything yet. And you're going on 15 vacations. You're like, but I got to enjoy the quality of life while I'm building. Well, you're not ready to build then. Because I can tell you when I was building, there was no vacations. It was 24-7. But I built something now. And there are times, when, and I've also now built a family. So I have to be there for both things. Right. Um, so I think you can't substitute hard work. I have a rule in my office, you're not allowed to complain unless you work harder than me. And even now, I'm going to outwork these kids. I have to. And, uh, but at the same time, I, I have no excuse. I made two lives. I better show up. All right, Scooter. So before we let you go, uh, we've got a few questions that we ask all of our guests here on Success Talks. So what book changed your life and why? Um, two books. Sorry. Uh, one was The Operator by David Geffen. He hates the book. I'm sorry I'm saying it out loud, but it inspired me. He inspired me. Um, the other one is Viktor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning. It's a really great book. 
Um, and it kind of talks about that idea of purpose. What's the best piece of advice that you ever received? Received some pretty amazing advice. <sighs> I think the golden rule is the best piece of advice you can ever give anyone. So I just think, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. I think that's the best advice anyone can give. Right. So here's a fun one. What are three things you can't live without? And leave out your phone, because everyone has to. Okay. Uh, Yale, Jagger, Levi. My wife and my kids. Yep. And finally, how do you define success? Um, I think it's cliche to say again, but Yale, Jagger, and Levi. Um, because, you know, if you give me any obstacle and you say, I have a 0.001% chance of succeeding, I'm like excited because that means there's an answer. And I like the challenge of things and I want to go figure it out. Um, but with family, you know, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of work, but you never know if you're going to find it. Never know if you're going to find, you know, the other half to make it happen. And I feel so fortunate that that has happened to me. And I feel like the greatest success I'll ever have is the fact that now I have like a true legacy. And I really think that when you, when you make life is when you finally understand death. I know that's what happened when I met my first son. Yeah. Because I was trying to figure out how do I love this person more than anyone I've ever loved in my entire life. But they weren't here for all the stuff that I've been through. And I don't even know them. I don't know what this person's person. He's a blob. I don't know what his personality is. Yeah. And then you realize that because they didn't exist, one day you won't exist. And the circle of life will continue and you realize how insignificant you are. And then you realize how much you got to do to get as much of the good stuff that you've learned into this little blob right. <laughs> as possible. Um, so I hope that is my success. I don't think I've done it yet. Draw on the way. Trying. Scott. Scooter, thanks okay, so much. Okay, we're friends now. You call me <laughs> I know. Scott. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Man, Scooter is a pretty amazing guy. He has a lot on his plate, and he seems almost superhuman in how he manages to get it all done and make time for his family. But Scooter doesn't think of himself as extraordinary. He believes he is doing nothing more than using the tools given to him to succeed. Perhaps that's the way we all should be viewing what we do. We may want to be extraordinary, but it's no matter if we are or are not, because each of us has abilities that can help us succeed. Focus on those and you could change the way you act and therefore change your odds of success. Scooter said something else that I want to discuss briefly. He said, I'd rather feel failure and get a chance of success than feel nothing. Too often, we're afraid to try something because of fear of failure. It holds us back from so many things, both in business and in life. But consider the alternative. If you don't try, then you have no chance of success, like Scooter said. And trying, even if you experience failure once in a while, is better than not feeling anything at all. Especially since when we do fail, there is always the opportunity to learn for next time. Don't miss the chance of feeling the sweet reward of success just because you might also feel the pang of failure. Finally, I thought when Scooter talked about legacy, what he had to say was interesting. He feels that people might not remember him, but they might feel his impact. They might recognize how he affected change or his impact could be felt through how he raises his children. Have you ever considered your impact? What are you doing now to leave your mark so that future generations can benefit from your deeds and knowledge? Perhaps it's time that we rethink how we view our legacies and stop trying to be remembered for ourselves, but instead focus on how we can leave a mark bigger and greater than ourselves. Focus on how you can impact the future. Welcome, Success Listener. Shelby Skirhawk here, Director of Digital Content for Success.com and co-host of the podcast, Success Insider. Technology, both a blessing and a curse. I remember a time before social media, cell phones, before email even. But now through the power of the interwebs, we can communicate quicker and more productive than ever. But at what cost? 
If I can reach other people day or night, they can certainly reach me. So technology has become an integral part of our lives, but is it doing more harm than good? That's the question that our guest today has sought to answer. Amy Blankson has been named Point of Light by two presidents, and in 2007, she co-founded GoodThink to bring the science of happiness to organizations. She's a best-selling author of several books, including her most recent one, The Future of Happiness, Five Modern Strategies for Balancing Productivity and Well-Being in the Digital Era. Amy wants to make sure we aren't letting technology diminish our joy and gratitude and instead help drive it and improve it. Welcome, Amy. It's so great to have you here on Success Talks. Awesome. So glad to be here. So I want to dive right in because there's a lot of talk and controversy on this topic of whether or not technology is helping us or hindering us day to day. So you cite research that shows that personal digital device use has really contributed to higher levels of depression and medical complications. So explain how so and Really, I mean, how can these small little devices cause so many issues? So it's interesting that in the last 10 years since the iPhone came out in 2007, depression rates in the United States have doubled. Now, that's not because necessarily of technology, but it is a correlation that at the same time, we're seeing that these devices that were supposed to make us so much happier haven't necessarily done that. There's not a connection between happiness and technology in the way that we always thought there would be. I mean, back in the day, we would think, you know, if I only I had a personal robot that could make my life so much easier. But when we get robots, they haven't really brought that promised uh, hope that we had thought was going to come. So I think that what we're seeing now is the effects, the side effects of technology bringing a whole host of new issues into our lives that we've never had to deal with before, um, whether it's the speed of innovation doubling in the last 10 years as well, or it is the number of um, devices that are flooding into our lives on a regular basis that we're not exactly sure how are you supposed to use all of these at once, what's good for us, what's not. Um, And so it requires us to really think through a little bit more about what we are looking for out of our technology. And so the the research that you do cite then about these side effects of technology, uh, name some of those. Sure. So I've seen studies over the last year in particular saying that screen time is the equivalent of digital heroin. Mm. Now, sometimes I think some of these are blown a little bit out of proportion. I think that they're sensationalized to capture news interest. Um, And in fact, that particular study that got a lot of play came from a non-research-based position. It was more of a a one-liner headline to grab people's attention. And so what we're hearing in the media is not necessarily what's happening in real life. I think that, yes, there is some side effects of technology. We know that uh, digital eye strain has gone up substantially, 70% among millennials. We know that text neck has become a major issue also with the millennials with more than 50% increase in chiropractic care for teenagers, which is huge. Um, And we know that the number of us who have the physical symptoms that we can all recognize, whether it's dry and burning eyes from looking at our screen too long or back pain, neck pain, finger pain, whatever it might be, These are side effects of sitting at the computer too long or looking down at our phones for too long that we have to really balance out what's good for us and what's not. So it's almost like a medication. Medication can can give us good, but also it can have side effects. So if we're going to go ahead and go with the hypothesis that technology is a good thing, that it connects us to people and information, will you share what the research says about technology's applications for happiness and, I guess, make the case for technology? So my stance on technology is that uh, it's that of William Shakespeare, actually. He once said that there is nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm. And I think that technology is actually just a tool. It doesn't make you happier and it doesn't make you unhappier. It's what you do with it that determines your outcome. And so when we look at what technology can do to increase happiness, sure, there's a ton of capacity from Facebook that's enabling you to um, to connect with friends all over the world, FaceTime that enables you to speak to relatives you may never have gotten to know before, 3D printed organs that can now save human lives. We've got these technologies that are truly mind-blowing and game-changing 
for the future of humanity. But we also have some technologies that are highly addictive, that are very frustrating, that are overwhelming. And so we've got to learn how do we deal with this? What do we do in our lives that makes us be able to use technology for its best and highest purposes? So technology certainly isn't going anywhere. It is a tool for us. Uh, But what does that mean for our happiness? I mean, how is it going to shape the way that we think about being happy or being grateful in our lives? Here's how I think about it. I think a lot of times we hear the idea that we need to take a digital detox. Like if we could just step away from our technology for a day, an hour, uh, a week, maybe even a month or forever, then our lives would be so much better. And I think that that is a really great strategy when you need to reset. In the same way that we do with diets, sometimes like I'll try the Dr. Oz three-day detox because I know I've had too much sugar and I want to get back to a good starting place. That's a really effective strategy for a reset, but not for real life. I think what happens is that we have technology in our lives. We know it's ubiquitous. We know it's never going to go away. So how do we live with it in a way that's sustainable, that's life-giving, and not just trying to escape it? And the best ways that I've found to do that are the strategies I mentioned in my book, The Future of Happiness, because they are the fundamental building blocks of how you can tie together the research that we've learned from the field of positive psychology with the information that we're seeing coming out about technological revolution. So how does the cognitive revolution match up with the technological revolution? What can we know about ourselves that can help us make better choices for the future? And so the book is filled with some really practical strategies about exactly how we can do that. So you found a lot of these strategies, I mean, through just numerous uh, research and interviews with people. And you mentioned that there's five, actually, that uh, successful people use to to thrive and, and kind of put digital technology to their advantage. So uh, share those with us, and, and, and we're going to touch on some of them more in depth. So sure. let's talk with the first one. Uh, stay grounded to focus and channel our energy with intention. Uh, talk a little bit about that. So I start the book with the idea of staying grounded, um, using the terminology and the language of uh, plugging an electrical plug into the wall. Now, you know, if you plug a a regular plug into the wall, it has two prongs on it. But if you add that third prong, like you see on a, a laptop cord, what that third prong does is it actually grounds the energy to make your energy more stable and more focused so the energy can flow better. And I love that visualization because for me what that means is that when we plug in ourselves, whether it's to the internet, a gaming device, our phone, whatever, how are we going to stay grounded in the midst of that? And what I mean by that, what the third prong is, is a set of guiding principles and beliefs that shape the way that we think about not only the world, but specifically our technology. So for instance, Uh, Part of how I stay grounded, my third prong is a focus on family. I've got three young children at home, and I know that if I'm going to be successful at work and balancing my family life, I need to be able to shut off at times, have really solid boundaries because having time with my family, it's really important to me. And so being grounded like that means that at the dinner table, we make a phone stack and we have everybody put their phone in the center of the table and we say, nobody's going to check their phone during dinner. The first person to grab the phone is in charge of dishes. <laughs> Very effective strategy here. Um, it also means that when I'm playing with my kids, I put my phone away because I really want to focus on quality time with them. I struggle with that sometimes, I'll be honest. I have great intentions, um, but at least I'm starting from a place of understanding where I want to be going and how I want to interact with technology. And what amazes me is how many times I meet people who have never thought about this. They've never thought about how they want to interact with technology or when or why. They just do. And it becomes a very reactive approach as opposed to proactive. And we all know that when you react to things, sometimes you can either overdo it or you miss out on some really important opportunities um, and priority prioritizing qui- quality time with your family as well. Well, I love that analogy because uh, you, you, talking about the, and again, I'm I'm not um, completely familiar with this idea, but the way I understand it then, the way you've explained it, is that you see the two plugs and you see the three plugs. And a uh, stronger, um, more powerful technology or pieces have the three prongs versus the two prongs. And so that is then the reason for that grounding. So I guess in our lives, you're saying that the more powerful the technology, the the greater need for grounding yourself, right? You nailed it. That's perfect. 
So this is something that we all certainly do struggle with. And, and, and you mentioned that. What do you mean by knowing how you want to interact with your technology, like understanding that relationship instead of just letting it be reactive all the time? Sure. So a very practical, I think with big concepts like this, we've got to go practical. So um, what I mean is that if I want to lay out and say, okay, I am setting an intention that I am only going to be on my phone for two hours a day. That means that I need to have some information gathering. So if I only want to be on the phone for that two hours, I need to know how much am I on it now? How much do I want to be on it? And what am I actually doing? And am I sticking to that? And so by being able to set that intention from the very get-go, it prevents me from just being on my phone indefinitely, right? It helps me to go from just picking up my phone every time I feel the impulse to suddenly saying, oh, is this really necessary? Because I set a boundary for myself that I don't want to be on it for that long. So this better be really good. Um, And I think that when we have those moments that we can refer back to our initial plan, uh, it's the same way we set intentions with our day. A lot of people have followed the advice of Brene Brown and other wonderful leaders that have been talking about intention and authenticity and our goal setting and our priorities. I think this is what Success Magazine is all about. And when we start our day with an intention, we say, okay, today my intention is to be as productive as possible, or my intention is to work out at least once today. Those individuals who set an intention and actually write it down are 40% more likely to actually follow through on their goals. And so this is where it becomes really important to think about when I start my day, do I want to set an intention that today I'm going to look people in the eye instead of looking at my phone? Or my intention is that I'm going to not talk to people with a screen in front of me. I'm always going to step aside away from the screen. Or I'm going to put my screen away every time that I want to um, really focus and get things done in my day. And by just taking just two seconds at the beginning of the day to set your intention around that and to set your intention as an individual human being for your life, how you want to interact, that helps you to be more effective, more focused, and more the person that you want to be. So Amy, I want to skip to the third strategy that you mentioned in the book, and that's training your brain to develop and sustain an optimistic mindset. So training our brains sounds a lot like training an animal. <laughs> and, it does. And it's, it's doable, but it's tricky and not really very straightforward. So how do we go about doing that? So training the brain and the idea is that your brain is actually something that is trainable, that we can learn strategies by trying different tactics, that we can almost trick our minds into doing things that we want it to do. So I know that an optimistic, positive brain is 40% more likely to be productive. It's three times more creative. It creates 23% less stress in my life. It makes me 50% less likely to develop heart disease, and it helps me to have a better chance of living to be 94. These are all proven statistics that are coming out of the field of positive psychology. So I know if I want that positive brain, I need to be proactive about it. And the way I'm going to be proactive is by training my brain. Now, this is where the cognitive revolution meeting the technological revolution is just amazing and so cool that we're living in this time period in our lives because what it means for us is that we can now peel back the layers of our mind to see what's really going on inside. Now, that sounds also very lofty, so let me bring it down a little bit more practical. Think about taking vitamins. For years and years, we've been told, take a vitamin, it's good for you. And so we swallow it, right? Mm -hmm. We don't really know if our vitamin K is low or if our potassium is a little high or too low. We just take it because we know it's good for us. The more information that we're getting about our bodies, we're getting to be more granular and being able to use blood tests or um, cortisol tests or whatever um, might be most useful for checking particular types of vitamins within our body. And now we know, okay, I specifically need B12, and so I'm going to take a B12 vitamin. The same thing is happening with positive mindset. Up until this point in history, we've always said, oh, I should 
be more positive. I should be grateful. And now what we're seeing is we know that gratitude can change your mindset to make you able to process the world in different ways and see new possibilities. We know that it makes you 10 times more accurate when you're doing particular types of skill sets where you're trying to, say, put together a set of blocks or solve a series of number tests. So if I want to get that particular outcome, and I know that's something that I need to work on, I can actually go do specific activities to train my brain. And what happens is it reinforces these neural pathways in our mind that strengthen a particular way of thinking. So we know with gratitudes that it is impossible to think at the same moment, both negative and positive. Now, why this is so important is because the human brain, and I'm going to get a little scientific here, but I think this is the meat of it. The human brain is a single processor. It means that at any given moment, the brain is receiving 11 million bits of information, but it can only process 40 bits of information in any given second. So 11 million versus 40. And what happens is that if your brain has been on autopilot and it's scanning the world for all the stresses, the hassles, the complaints in your life, it literally has no brain power left with which to be able to look for the good and the positive, the meaningful moments that provide so much sense of quality into your life. And so by training our brain to actually look for the positive rather than the negative, it helps your brain to be able to re- think the ways and the patterns that it's always operated with, which enables you to see those beautiful changes within your mind that lead you to productivity, accountability, focus, accuracy, um, and less stress in your life, which we all want, right? So these little bitty strategies are something that we can train our brain using programs like Happify, which has a series of online games that are free and wonderfully um, colorful and fun and addictive um, in a good way. It's technology for the good because you're doing something very intentional that you're trying to work on a skill. We also know that there's programs like Plasticity Labs that are helping people to be able to create that sort of mindset shift within the employee workspace. Um, and so as these platforms get more and more sophisticated, we're able to get more insight into ourselves that helps us to develop something that we've never had that capacity to before. And I can't recommend Happify enough. I, I, I love that app and I love the site too. And, and you know, I know success, uh, success.com, we often on our Facebook page, we will share a lot of Happify content and they'll share some of ours. And it's such a great fit because, you know, personal development, it goes hand in hand with with knowing your brain, realizing that your brain is a muscle, that it has to be trained, it has to be exercised, and 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 realizing how powerful that single processor, like you said, really is there, that, that we can do a lot with it. You just got to gotta give it some exercise. You got it. That's awesome. So that takes us to the next strategy, creating a habitat for happiness. So you know, we've talked a little bit about technology, that it always evolves, but that means that we often feel like we need to stay up on the the latest, uh, the latest both technology, the latest social media platforms, everything just for the fear of missing out. So explain how that can be detrimental to our efforts of creating a habitat for happiness. So it's a space issue. Short and simple, I think that we are now experiencing a flood of technology in our homes. And I call it the digital tech graveyard mm. because everybody has one. There's a closet, there's a drawer where there's this, I call it a Medusa's head of wires that <laughs> stares out of us and threatens to turn us to stone. We don't know what to do with this stuff. It's just there. And so what that means for us is that when we have that much stuff in our space, there's no space for anything new, very much like the example about the, the um, 40 bits of information that we're trying to deal with. This is our home. We need spaces to create, to invite in new things. And what we've learned is that when your house is cluttered, when you've got too many things that you don't know what to do with them, it literally makes the brain feel overwhelmed and it makes you feel frustrated like you can't do everything you want to do. So in practical terms, how many of you have ever felt like when you clean your office, all of a sudden you're more productive? <laughs> it's that same feeling with the technology that we go through our homes and we declutter for spring cleaning, but we never touch the technology piece. And so I wanted to tackle it in the book. I wanted to say, hey, this is actually an important part of being able to set yourself up for the future is making space for the future. 
And it's also about how we set up our environment so that we can be even more focused. So one of the simple, quick little strategies is based on a study that I read called the Mere Present Study. And what they did for this study was they took people, they put cell phones in front of them. One group got a cell phone and did a task, and one group put their cell phone away and they did a task, and they discovered, lo and behold, the ones who had their cell phone away more were more effective. But the surprise behind the study was that the individuals who had their phone in front of them, even if they didn't touch, look, or even interact with their phone, they still were lower in productivity. Really? And the reason was because they were anticipating that they might receive a message. And that idea is that I might be needed. And it's an addictive feeling. But I think that if we're able to find a way to process information a little bit easier and smoother, we actually have a process for dealing with digital stuff in our lives, it makes it easier for us to move forward. We've seen it happen already with our inboxes, that there are more and more sophisticated inboxes to help us archive or get our inboxes down to zero so you feel better that you can see what's there and control what you need to. But we don't yet have that process for our home or our workspaces. What do we do with those spaces and how do we organize them? And so the book is chock full of strategies from how do you sort and organize, where do you go to recycle and erase your hard drive, how do you make this something that's regular and routine in your home so it's not this big dramatic uh, production every spring or every 10 years. Right. (laughs) Um, And so that is my one of my favorite strategies for just getting ourselves ready for the future. So that's interesting that the 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 level of productivity or the effectiveness was diminished by just the mere presence of technology there. In all of this research, I mean there there is certainly um, some something to be said about a a less cluttered home for for technology you know not necessarily saying that a, a happy a happy habitat is completely devoid of technology uh, I mean I know that's not reasonable for a lot of people I know probably both you know your kids and mine would be devastated if their Xbox was gone or their iPad was gone but does technology have a happy medium there where we can still have this happy habitat, but still help us live and learn better? Yes and yes. So when I do talks around the globe, I often get people coming up to me after the talk saying, oh my goodness, I'm so grateful you didn't tell me I have to get rid of my phone. I thought you were going to. (laughs) There is Uh, love-hate of technology, of course, but I think that people are so worried. They know the value of this thing that they've come to grow and love and see the value of it, and they don't want to have to get rid of it. So let me just put you to rest. You do not need to get rid of your phone or your technology. I love technology. I think it's amazing, and it's adding so much to my life. But here's what we need to do. We need to find the edge of what I call the happiness cliff. So the happiness cliff is that point at which you could be at your maximum level of happiness and productivity without going over the edge. Because what happens sometimes, and let's just use Facebook as an example, is that you're surfing on Facebook for a while, you're getting a great kick out of catching up with some of your friends and touching base or seeing someone's new little child who was born and um, looking at old photos that brought back up uh, what you did two years ago. That's awesome. The problem is that sometimes we get into this pattern of surfing on Facebook and we're scrolling, 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 And then time has slipped by. You don't know what happened to it. And you look down, you're like, oh, my gosh, it's been an hour, hour and a half. And your maximum utility for Facebook was back at 30 minutes. So you spent an hour running off the edge of the happiness cliff before you realize the ground has dropped out beneath you. And what we're trying to do is figure out learning your own body and your own system to recognize when is that happiness cliff edge going to hit for me? Because the moment you go over, you're losing all the value that you had gained. And the same thing happens with checking email. We learned that if you check your email three times a day, that's your maximum point of productivity. If you're checking email constantly, you're actually becoming less productive over the course of the day. So little tricks like this teach us, for myself, for me, this is my boundary, and it's different for everyone. I often get the question, well, you know, how much should I let my teenage son be on the computer? And they want me to tell them a specific hour, like the American Academy of Pediatrics has been pretty prescriptive with numbers about how much you should be on the computer. I actually take a very different approach. I say that it's a little bit like... um, 
of like getting a sunburn, that we all have different skin types that can handle different amounts of sun. And we have to learn our own bodies. I am pretty fair skin. So I know that I can be out in the sun for about 20 minutes without sunscreen. And then I absolutely need to put something on or I will burn. Um, my husband has darker skin. And so he's, he's in a different boat than I am. He can handle it a little bit longer. So I say the same thing that for a number of individuals, if you are a heavy tech user, you're on the computer constantly for work, you can handle that if you use a lot of really good strategies. For instance, taking a break uh, to get up from your desk every once in a while, going for a walk, if you exercise for at least an hour during the day, if you take time to look people in the eye every time you can so that you're not always looking at the screen. These strategies make you able to be able to balance better. But even if you only use the phone for an hour a day, but you're using horrible posture and your neck starts to hurt, that's your body saying, that's enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> you need to you need to cool it. So learning these cues from ourselves makes it possible for us to be able to live with technology in a way that is sustainable for the long run and fuels our happiness. Well, I'm glad that we got to to talk about all this stuff because I know that yeah, there probably were a lot of people that are afraid that you were going to tell them no phones, no technology. And, you know, we know that's not reasonable. If anything, you're saying that there's a lot of great applications and 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 strategies that you can use to enhance your happiness and also enhance, which is, you know, the, the theme of this month's issue, gratitude, realizing that that is um, such a powerful um, connector to happiness. So, before we let you go, we've got a few questions that we always ask our uh, guests here on Success Talks. So you ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. What's the one technology addiction that you've had the hardest time breaking? Okay. It's time to be honest here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think that sleeping with my phone beside my bed. I love to read myself to sleep. And despite all the research from the National Sleep Cl Clinic that say that it is really bad to look at a screen right before bed, I love it. I do. So that's my guilty pleasure. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I'm i guilty of playing like just little puzzle apps like before I go to bed. And I know the blue light stuff. I know all that the, the research that says that it does keep you awake. Right. But, <laughs> but I, I like that wah, kind wah, of wah, night. Wah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could bring back one piece of old technology to replace a more modern version, what would it be? That one's easy. I had just had this conversation with my husband. I would wish that the gaming device controllers would go back to the original Nintendo controller yes. because there are too many freaking buttons. I, I can't handle all the buttons. <laughs> it shakes and vibrates. It makes me nervous. <laughs> um, and I am a big fan of the old Super Tetris. So I think that if it was just a little bit simpler, I would be back playing with my husband doing those games. But for now, I can steer clear. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice that anyone's ever given you? The best piece of advice? Mm. I think the best piece of advice is to... Oh, I have to think about this. <laughs> I think the best piece of advice is to be intentional in all that you do. I think that when I start my day with that focus, that mindset, everything goes different. And I once heard someone say that the individuals who wake up and they make their bed at the beginning of the day are more productive than other individuals. And I think it starts right then. It starts with an intention when you make your bed that says today is going to be a good day. So I love that idea. I try to live it. It's a pro work in progress for sure, but it's been a really powerful piece of advice for me. And finally, how do you define success? I define success as looking at the world through a lens that makes me happy. Now, that could mean that I am living my life in a way that is not the most productive, but the way that I'm looking at my life is something that brings me joy, then I'm being successful. So it's not about what the world thinks, but what, a, what I think about it and the lens I'm using. Fantastic, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us here on Success Talks. Thanks, Shelby. That was an eye-opening conversation between Shelby and Amy. 
makes me rethink how I am using the technology at my disposal. I think one of the biggest problems we all have is letting technology drive us. We aren't always intentional in how and when we use it. It's there, it surrounds us, supports us, and, well, in some sense, we can't live without it now. But that doesn't mean that it has to be the driving force in our lives. We need to know how we're going to interact with our technology so that it best serves our needs, and how we can use it for its best and highest purpose. If having your phone in your pocket means you pull it out frequently, put it somewhere else. Leave it on the counter for a few hours and focus on playing with your kids, writing, reading. Go outside. Yes, you can go out without your phone to track how many miles you're walking. It's okay. The point is to let technology be an asset to your life and how you plan it. Don't plan your life around the technology. Part of technology's purpose could be in support of your overall well-being. I mean, why not? Technology is a tool, just like a treadmill or a bike. But this tool can help us with our mental well-being, if used properly, that is. Technology itself can't make us happier or unhappier, but how we use it can. So start by tracking your use of technology. How often are you on your computer or smartphone? How much TV do you watch? Why are you using that device? Is it for work or personal? Then work on scaling that back because I can tell you right now, you probably are using technology way more than you think. Amy even suggests doing a spring cleaning of your tech. No, you don't need that cable from two laptops ago because it might be useful one day. It's not going to be useful. Ditch it. Get rid of the technology you don't use daily. I mean, come on, when was the last time you actually plugged in that VHS player? Why do you still have that phone from two upgrades ago? You just don't need them anymore, so clear them out. And I want to touch on what Amy said about gratitude, since that is the theme this month. She told us that it is impossible to be both positive and negative at the same time. So remove the negativity that you see out there on social media and the news, wherever else you're looking to be more intentional. Then practice the art of gratitude. You can start simple. Every night before you go to bed, say one thing that you're grateful for from that day. Even this little step can start retraining your brain to be more inclined toward the positive, which ultimately can lead to other things like better productivity, focus, and accuracy in your work and life. And who doesn't want that? So try it. What are you grateful for today? And don't say your smartphone. Welcome, success listeners. Shelby Skirhawk here, Director of Digital Content for Success.com and co-host of the podcast Success Insider. Gratitude. It's an emotion expressing recognition and appreciation for what you have. This basic emotion has been gaining traction as a facet of positive psychology because scientific studies have proven that cultivating gratitude can increase our well-being and overall happiness. But gratitude starts small thinking about the little things in life. And that's important when some days, those really tough days, it seems like the small things in life are the only things going right. Our guest today, best-selling author Ann Grady, knows the feeling. She's a two-time TEDx speaker who's developed a recipe for gracious resiliency that she shares worldwide, helping people find happier, more courageous lives. Welcome, Ann. Thanks so much for joining us here on Success Talks. Oh, thank you for having me. So before we dive into a little bit of the how of being more resilient and, and certainly more grateful, um, share with us a little bit of your story. I mean, what makes you so passionate about this particular topic? Well, so my story starts back when my son Evan was born. He's now 14 years old, and Evan is severely mentally ill. He's got a handful of diagnoses, but basically you say up, he says down. You say right, he says left. You say take a bath, he says I'm going to kill you, and he means it. <laughs> And so when he was 18 months old, I found myself as a single mom. Um, he first tried to kill me when he was three years old. And it was a very scary, lonely place to be. And I thought, well, you know, I've got a master's degree in communication. Surely I should be able to navigate this. But what I found very quickly is that none of the skills that I had learned in school had prepared me for dealing with what was happening in my life. Uh, he went through two extended hospitalizations. I lived at the Ronald McDonald House, and I thought, you know, 
wow, I've, I've been resilient. But then in 2014, when we were discharging him from another hospitalization, I was diagnosed with a tumor in my salivary gland. And it turned out to be a lot larger than expected. It resulted in facial paralysis, which required surgery for me to put a gold weight into my upper eyelid and stitch up the bottom eyelid before I started radiation, but not before I fell down a flight of stairs and broke my foot in four places. So I very quickly needed to figure out how do I build strength? How do I stay resilient so I can not only survive, but thrive during all of these challenges? And so in this, 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 one thing after another after another and in that very difficult time in your life you you write in the intro that that you realize that you know people would talk to you and they would say you know oh you're you're you know you're you're so strong and 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 you you're so resilient but you didn't necessarily feel it why is that well, I, I don't think many of us feel strong or resilient at the time that we're going through a challenge and that's the that's the whole contradiction of it. That's that's really when you're building resilience. And so because I've learned how to utilize these skills, and that's what they are, they're really a skill set, I've gotten really passionate about sharing them with other people because the average person experiences five to six traumas in a lifetime. And we're taught algebra and we're taught English and reading and science, but we're not really taught how to bounce back from challenges and setbacks. And we know now that it's one of the defining factors of success, both personally and professionally. So um, no, I didn't feel strong. And, and I've found out since then, you don't really have to be perfect. You just have to be strong enough. You just have to have the skills to help you navigate through the situation. And if you use it properly, you become stronger as a result. So give us a little bit of an understanding of resilience itself. We know from our studies and, you know, personal development that resilience is key to facing adversity. And that's really what makes all the difference. But so Give us a baseline of what exactly resilience is. So resilience is your ability to bounce back from stressful events or negative experiences. It's your ability to recover. And for some, it, it looks very different than for others. But, you know, we hear this cliche, 10% of life is what happens. 90% is how you deal with it. And it really is true. And, you know, I used to think that resilience was a, a genetic trait or marker like skinny thighs. You either have it or you don't. But what I've come to appreciate is that it is a very specific set of skills. And if you can learn them proactively, then when you are in a situation that requires them, rather than reacting and giving away your power, you're able to really take that back and own it because you've taken time to develop those uh, so that when you need them, they're there. So let's break down some of those factors in how resilient we are. I mean, what are the things that that go into building this skill set? So first, it's understanding that our strength comes through struggle. Most people don't like to feel uncomfortable and our brain keeps us stuck. Our brain is actually designed to prevent us from changing. And so we get stuck in our uncomfortable pattern, patterns. And if we're not careful, we get in a rut. And a rut is really just a grave with no ends. So our ability to remain resilient starts by saying, how have the things that have happened to me so far in my life, what have they taught me? What have I learned from them? Part of it is simply perspective. Part of it is developing daily habits that are going to help you be more resilient. For example, um, many of us don't like to deal with difficult emotions, whether it's grief or sadness or fear. We don't like the discomfort of it, so we run from those feelings. But what we know about really resilient people is that they learn how to process those emotions and they give themselves time to recover from those. So if we're learning how to manage our emotions, take care of ourselves mentally and physically, and really start to cultivate the habits that are linked to resilience, such as gratitude, such as meditation and mindfulness, things that we hear all of the time that seem like such common sense, but that unfortunately are just not very common practice. So it sounds like we need to be very self-aware or uh, emotionally intelligent in order to to be on this, this correct path. Uh, will you talk to us about that role of emotional intelligence in, in being 
strong enough as as the title of your book suggests? Sure. So uh, emotional intelligence has been a big buzzword in the business community for the last 20 years. And in its most simplified form, it's basically your ability to understand yourself, your emotions, how your mood shows up, how it affects the people around you, understanding the emotions of others, and then using that information to guide the way we act and behave. And so you you mentioned having to be self-aware, and that's really what it boils down to. If we understand how we typically react to stress, for example, then we can identify some of the triggers. We can't necessarily change the trigger, but we can manage our reaction to it more effectively. So the ability to self-regulate, for example, our emotional brain works 80,000 times faster than our logical brain. And it's it was meant as a protection mechanism. So if we see a saber-toothed tiger running at us, immediately we go into this fight, flight, or freeze state. Well, when that happens, we are not able to process logically. Our, our frontal lobe, our prefrontal cortex just shuts down and, and we're reacting from a place of stress. And much of our life is spent in reactionary mode because we're constantly taking on more than we can possibly get done. We're tired. We've got lots of things going on personally and professionally. So part of the emotional intelligence scale behind this is understanding how to regulate your emotion, how to navigate stressful situations so that you can recover from them more quickly, more easily, um, and be more fluid and flexible and adaptive based on what's going on at the time. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about why your reaction, your emotion is is the first thing that you go to and how you can realize that that your emotion moves faster than your your brain or your your intelligent thinking. Great question. So our brain has gone through three levels of evolution. We've got the reptilian brain or snake brain that's responsible for breathing, heart rate, respiration, things that we don't even think about. Then we've got the limbic system, and that's the part of our brain, the emotional part of our brain, and it's responsible for memories and habits and and the way we process our emotion. And then the newest evolution is the prefrontal cortex, like you just mentioned. And this is the part of um, my son's brain that doesn't work very well. It's it's controls emotional regulation, problem solving, planning, organization, emotional regulation. And what happens when we perceive a threat, now whether that's a physical threat, like we see a snake, or it's a snarky email from our boss, our brain goes into the same protection mode. And it's flooded with these uh, chemicals like cortisol and adrenaline, noradrenaline, norepinephrine. And originally they were created to help us survive. Blood you know, drains from our brain and goes into our limbs and prepares us to either fight, run away, freeze. Uh, and as we've evolved, unfortunately, that has not changed a whole lot. So when we are emotionally hijacked, it means that we have been triggered and we have a knee-jerk reaction. And for most of us, it's not necessarily the best reaction. So emotional intelligence means that you start understanding how to identify what those triggers are, how to understand your natural uh, emotional response to things so that you become more deliberate about it. For example, have you ever gotten a phone call where you looked at the caller ID and were less than thrilled to see who was on the phone? I think most of us have. Well, in that situation, we react. And when we do, we are letting other people dictate our response. Part of resilience and its link to emotional intelligence means that you are creating um, a plan ahead of time so that whenever possible, you're able to mitigate some of those reactions because you've already thought through how you're going to deal with them. Um, When we do go through a difficult time, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to handle it flawlessly. But when we build those skills and we create the habits to pay attention to how we're feeling and how our emotions are driving our behavior and you know, what is it that people say at work that really just make us cringe? Or what are some things that happen in our life that evoke a response that is not one that is ultimately going to be the most helpful for us? And the more we think about it and the more we practice it, the more able we are to start regulating that emotion and that part of our brain so that we can take back control. I think that's a key there, emotional hijacking, because that's a great way of, of thinking about all of the, I don't want to call them threats necessarily, but I mean, I guess they are kind of threats to your to your emotion, to your well-being, just to your your mood. And it can plummet your productivity and, and <laughs> everything behind it. So you said that um, 
paying attention to your feelings and then developing habits um, in order to pay attention to those feelings and then and think ahead of what to do. What are some of those first steps? So the first step is to identify your reactions to stress. So when you are triggered, whether it's a, a person or a situation, what happens to you physically and emotionally? Are you feeling anxious? Do your palms sweat? Does your stomach get tight? Do your shoulders feel tense? Because until we're able to recognize what's happening physically, physiologically, we're not really able to manage our response to it. And I'll give you an example. I get triggered when I'm lost. So I am directionally challenged in every <laughs> sense of the word. And when I can't find my way somewhere, I get very flustered and I feel my hands sweat, my heart races, I get really nervous. Uh, and so knowing that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't happen when I can't find my way, but it means that I can do some things ahead of time to ensure that I have an easier time finding where I'm going. And so it's understanding what your reactions are so that when you have them, you understand how to respond to them. That's really the first step. It's it's making a list. What are the things, what are the, what are the kinds of um, things that happen in my life or the people in my life who tend to evoke really strong reactions physically or emotionally? And why is that? Because when you start to begin to understand the why, you can start to craft your response to it. Great advice in in trying to recognize what some of your triggers are. Therefore, you can and plan ahead and, and think out of of what are some things that you can avoid those triggers, and then what are some things that that you can do when you're feeling um, triggered by something. Uh, all of this goes into emotional intelligence and and resilience. Now, talk to me about the connection between resilience and then being strong and and kind of being triumphant over difficult situations in our lives? I tend to think of resilience as a muscle that unfortunately you can't build during a spa day or a relaxing day on vacation. Generally, when we are building resilience is because we're going th through things that are uncomfortable. And because we don't like discomfort, we run from it. Um, we know that folks who tend to practice resilience are happier, healthier, more productive, better leaders, better parents and partners, they tend to see things very differently. And resilience is uh, your ability to bounce back is really determined every time you face an obstacle or a setback, how are you choosing to react and respond to it? Because little stressors and the way we re respond to those often give us a really great look at how we're likely to respond to the bigger things that happen in our life. Um, we know that people who practice uh, gratitude, who practice resilience, lower their stress levels. They tamp down their stress response. You can actually rewire your brain. And that's what I find so fascinating about all of this through neuroplasticity and the way that our brain works. You can completely train yourself to cultivate the skills that go along with resilience, emotional intelligence, gratitude. It just requires you to be aware and deliberate about the choices that you make. You know, we all have habits that support our success and we have habits that sabotage our success. And our life is made up of those choices and those habits. So rather than continuing to react to them, this is really an opportunity to say, what habits can I develop to help me grow stronger, more triumphant. So what are some habits that we can develop then to practice gratitude? So what we know about the link between gratitude and resilience is that people who practice gratitude tend to bounce back from difficult times more easily than others. And it sounds like a touchy, fluffy, feely, you know, like one of those really sweet concepts, but the research supports it to the point where now it's being predicted as the number one determinant of well-being. It, you don't even have to find anything to be grateful for. That's what I find so fascinating. Simply the act of looking for things for which you're grateful, release serotonin and dopamine, which are the feel-good neurotransmitters in your brain. And when you start to find them, you start to look for more of them. So it creates this cycle. And those positive emotions have been linked to helping you lower blood pressure and stress, lower depression and anxiety, um, improve decision making and problem solving. It really, your ability to think optimistically, to think from a place of gratitude 
creates new neural pathways in your brain that prepare you to bounce back when you do have a particularly difficult time. They're, they're directly correlated. So if there are so many benefits to being grateful and practicing it on a daily basis, and like you said, even just the practice of thinking about what you're grateful for, not necessarily finding results, just, just the, that act of it. If that has so many benefits, why is it still so hard for us to do? It's so difficult because it's it's against our very nature. Our brain was intended to protect us. So if I'm walking down a path, I'm more likely to look out for a snake than a beautiful flower. We're drawn to the negative. So from a gratitude perspective, we actually have to create and cultivate the habits that go along with it. For example, I, I think we all know that we should eat better and exercise more and, and get more sleep. That doesn't always translate into actually doing it. So there's, there's a disconnect between knowing that you need to do something and making the emotional connection to have enough motivation to actually do it. And it, if you wait for it to happen, it won't. You'll be disappointed. So you have to initiate it by starting to cultivate habits like every morning when you wake up what is something that you feel grateful for every every time you take a bite of food savoring it and thinking about it and all of those things sound very small but when you start to add them up you start to change the way your brain looks at things so you begin to see opportunity instead of difficulty you begin to see hope instead of depression and it and it really does start to create what they call an upward spiral so in the introduction to your book you write you find what you look for stop looking for all the reasons life isn't fair and horrible things happen don't be a victim it's easy to blame everybody and everything around you but here's where I am and what I have to work with. And then you continue saying, basically, get off your ass and be grateful. So I'd like to know how you have applied this idea of gratitude and and resilience um, to your own life and how, whether or not you realized that you were doing these things when you were right in the midst of all of those challenges. And then what do you see now in, in hindsight? It's a great question, and I think that we don't see it while it's happening. We're able to look back with hindsight and learn from it. It's actually called post-traumatic growth. And so a few of the things that have helped me cultivate gratitude, one is something I call a delicious moment. And a delicious moment is basically an everyday moment that we tend to just gloss over rather than really taking it in. So it could be having a great conversation with a friend, or in my case, it was having my son get a haircut without me feeling anxiety. I, I realized he was getting a haircut and I had no anxiety. It used to take three or four people to hold him down while we did that. And so simply acknowledging in that moment that I felt no anxiety, that I that I was so grateful that it was an easy outing, um, helps you start to look for more of those. So for example, I'm staring right now in my office, I have a, a poster that says collect beautiful moments and I've got pictures and, and I've got cards that I, I write things that have happened recently that really just bring me joy. And because of that, you start to focus your energy on finding those. You know, it's the whole, it's the law of attraction. What we think about, we bring about. And when you are thinking about and looking for those great moments, you begin to find more of them. Um, another gratitude strategy that's helpful is to realize it's a choice. You know, things happen to us. It, it isn't good or bad or right or wrong. It's certainly not fair. But when they do, what can we learn from it? How can we take a really challenging situation and turn it around and figure out how we can use it as an opportunity? And again, that's not easy to do in the moment. That's why it's so important to cultivate these habits before you really need them. When a lot of these, these challenges happen in our lives, um, it can be easy to listen to the negativity. And, and I think something that we can all struggle with and we all identify with is that that negative little voice, that doubting little voice in your head that that can really affect your ability to be grateful. So how do we quiet that that negative voice in there in your head that that is pushing out all of the the beautiful moments in your life? Yeah, I always think of it like a, a little devil and an angel on your shoulder. <laughs> One of them's saying kind things, the other's not. And the question to ask is, how do you talk to yourself about yourself, 
What is it you're saying to yourself about how you are, who you are, and who you want to be? Because most of us would not speak to our best friend the way we speak to ourselves. We send ourselves these self-defeating messages that create doubt and fear and self-limiting beliefs. So part of it is being very clear about what you want to say to yourself. So, for example, I used to think, I can't do it. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. There's no way I can do this anymore. Well, excuses and those thoughts are very real, but they're not serving us. So the ability to come up with a replacement thought is really the way to start training your brain. So it's not very helpful. A lot of people think you should go from negative to positive. I can't do this to I can do this better than anybody. And that isn't realistic and your brain doesn't work that way. But if you can go from a negative thought to a realistic thought instead of I can't do this, it is what it is, and all I can do is all I can do. I'll take it one day at a time. That starts to reshape the way you communicate with yourself. So it's not just a matter of how we talk to ourselves. It's whether we let ourselves listen to that voice. And it's hard. This is not easy. If it were easy, everyone would do it. It requires you to really stop and think about what messages are keeping you stuck so that you can start to break those down and and exchange them with more productive thoughts. And it's a daily practice of, of one of these life skills that you don't learn in school. And so it's a matter of, like you said, building that muscle of resiliency and and using gratitude and all of those other those skills to to get you there. So and really great stuff. Thank you so much. But before we let you go, I've got a few more questions we'd like to ask everyone here on Success Talks. Are you ready? I'm ready. What do you know now that you wish you knew then? So I think that happiness happens in blips. You know, when we're kids, we're told you're going to grow up, be successful, live happily ever after. And then when things don't go exactly according to plan, we feel unsuccessful or defeated. Instead of setting ourselves up for failure, I think if we learn to appreciate moments of happiness, those add up. Instead of feeling like we're doing something wrong when we're not happy, it's searching for those moments that bring us joy and fulfillment and and spending more time thinking about those rather than all the reasons things aren't going well. You know, I'm a big fan of Sean Aker and and his research around happiness and it it really is true. Most of us think, well, when I'm successful, I'll be happy. And what we know now through the research is it could not be more backwards. You become successful because you cultivate an attitude of gratitude because you are happy and because you are grateful and resilient, that's what launches you to success, not the other way around. What's the best single piece of advice that anyone has ever given you? Well, my grandmother always used to tell me, if you act like an ass, don't be surprised if people try to ride you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Um, I, I think for me, it was, it, it was a pretty blanket statement, a pretty blunt statement. Look, if you're not happy with the results you're getting in your life, you have two choices. You can change the way you're thinking and behaving to get a different result, or you can settle for the result you're getting based on how you think and behave. It doesn't work any other way. And that, to me, really summarizes everything you need to know about creating the life you want. If you're not getting what you need and what you want, you have to be prepared to think and behave differently. And that requires some courage, some discomfort, some resilience. And finally, Anne, how do you define success? How do I define success? Well, I am a self-proclaimed recovering perfectionist. For a long time, I thought if I just kept my head down and worked harder and, and worked harder than everyone, that I would be successful. But it's kind of like swimming in an ocean, right? If you, if you just try to keep your head down and swim, you get carried off by the current. Success for me is saying, here's my lighthouse, Here's what I'm working toward. Here's what it means for me. It's a very personal decision. And is what I'm doing each day getting me closer to reaching that goal or not? And if it's not, then I need to reevaluate. Because a lot of us say we know what our priorities are, but our actions don't match up with them. So it's being very clear on what success means to you and then making small decisions each day to get you one step closer to reaching it, knowing that there is no end. Right. We, it's not it's not like you achieve it and you're done. It's the constant pursuit of making improvements, of trying to 
learn and better yourself and and be a, a source of good in the world and make a difference for others. And that really um, is what it boils down to. Are you impacting this world in a positive way? Because even the smallest um, even the smallest things can create a huge ripple and impact people in ways that we never thought possible. And great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Anne had a lot of great things to say about how being more grateful can impact our lives. Through her work, Anne has realized that gratitude is one of the number one determinants of overall well-being. Practicing gratitude can have a far-reaching impact in our lives. First, you have to realize that gratitude is a choice, because the truth is that gratitude and positive thinking in general go against our very nature. Our brains were built to expect the worst and be prepared. We have to actively and consciously make the choice to be grateful in our lives for all that we have. Anne recommends that you start by adding up the small things. Savor your food. Take a moment to stop and look at the beautiful blue sky. Smell the roses, if you will, and just appreciate the good and beautiful in the world around you. These smaller things will create an upward spiral that will have you being grateful for much more in no time. Ever notice how when you get a new car and you start driving it, you then start seeing that same car everywhere on the road? That's because you're more aware of it. The same applies to gratitude. You can also contribute directly to that upward spiral by surrounding yourself with things you're grateful for. Pictures of loved ones, etc. Or hanging notes on your wall or mirror that are positive reinforcement to remind you of everything good in your life. That isn't to say you won't experience the bad things. In fact, being more grateful can help you during those down times. Anne talks about how our ability to bounce back and recover after difficult situations is 10% life happens, pura vida, as my friends in Costa Rica say, and it's 90% our ability to deal with it. Retraining your brain through the power of gratitude is a way for us to develop the skills we need to navigate a situation to see it from a realistic point of view rather than one of devastation or remorse. If we're actively working on changing our personal messaging, like Anne suggests, then when you encounter failure, a roadblock, or just the unexpected, you will be able to deal with it in a more positive and timely manner so that you don't get sidetracked from what really matters. Hey, hey, Josh Ellis here, the editor-in-chief of Success Magazine. Men, they are tough nuts to crack. I can say that because I am one, right? I've been told by more than a few people, a few girlfriends included, that we men can be difficult, opaque, and all-around challenging to deal with. But it's not without reason. There is this expectation or traditional notion, if you will, of masculinity that is instilled in boys from a young age. We're supposed to be tough, aggressive even, uh, unemotional and work harder than everyone else. We live the way our dads taught us and their dads taught them and so on and all the way back. Generations of masculinity brought to life. But is it all necessary? Is the masculine bravado and the need to win at all costs worth what it is costing us? Maybe, maybe not. That is what Lewis Howes, the lifestyle entrepreneur and New York Times bestselling author, examines in his new book, The Mask of Masculinity. How men can embrace vulnerability, create strong relationships, and live their fullest lives. Lewis was at the height of his goals with everything that he thought would make his life fulfilled, but something was still missing. None of what he'd been working toward for five years brought him joy. So he set out to discover why not and how he could fix it. And here he is to talk about his findings with us to help men live fuller lives and women to understand men better to build better relationships with them. Lewis, my man. It is so good to have you on Success Talks. 
I'm excited about your new book and talking about your personal journey. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we like it when worlds can collide here from uh, from from the uh, the podcast sphere, and yeah, um, definitely love your show, and and so it's great to have you on Success Talks. You've been a guest on Success Insider, but we'll go a little bit deeper this time. What do you say? I appreciate it. Yeah, I feel like this is uh, like an NPR episode the way you introduced it, so <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, all right, let me just take a quick sip of my coffee. Very NPR-like, right? <laughs> okay. Well, let's start at the beginning. You were in a really great place in life. You had reached a lot of your goals, but as you've written, something was still missing. What was going through your head around that time, and how did you work out the why uh, behind your lack of fulfillment, even while you were already doing things you love to do? Yeah, well, I appreciate the question, Josh. I think for for me, I was achieving everything in the outer world that I wanted, but my inner world, I wasn't achieving what I wanted still. And I think there's two worlds we always play in. It's like the world that everyone else sees and then the world that only we see inside of ourselves. And for me, I was so driven to achieve in order to prove the bullies when I was six and seven years old wrong and to prove to whatever that I felt like I was man enough and could achieve enough to, to show that I was worthy in the world. And so for me, I was so driven to prove people wrong or to prove that I was right or I was better than that. I was making it all happen. I was, you know, achieving these goals and these dreams, but then right after I would achieve them, I was just so miserable and so angry and resentful of everyone around me and myself. And I didn't want to be around anyone right when I would achieve these big things. And this was just a constant pattern from my teens to my twenties. And it just, I didn't understand. I just thought this was the way of life. I guess I was just like, well, I'm never going to be satisfied. It's never going to be enough. I'm never making enough money. And then, you know, I reach these goals and they're not, they're still not good enough for me. So I need to keep striving for more. And that, um, I had a wake up call when I was about 30, I got in a really bad fight. I wouldn't say it was that bad, but for me, it was a fight that I, I haven't been in a fight in 15 years or something since I was a teenager. And I got in a really bad fight on a basketball court where hmm. I allowed my, my kind of anger to, to be unleashed when really it didn't need to be. It was just a pickup game. It was like a, a fun game outside. And I allowed my ego to make sure that I was man enough looking to the, the people playing, um, was threatened and, my masculinity was threatened or so I felt. And I ended up lashing out and, you know, doing a, having a pretty bad fight where at the end of the fight, I, I looked at the guy and was terrified of what I'd done because it was just, I was like a monster in that moment. And, um, it was kind of my wake up call where I was just like, wow, am I really 30 years old and allowing myself to allow some argument or some guy stepping to my masculinity, allow me to lash out and physically hit someone. Um, and for me, it was a big wake up call. It was just like, okay, Lewis, this is a pattern that has repeated itself in different ways. Some emotionally, mentally, and now physically, uh, with another guy. And it's time to, look inward to see why first I'm reacting this way. What is upsetting me so much? Why have I been living with this resentment, this fear, this anger, this frustration for so long? Um, when moments like this come up now in general, I was a happy, loving, supportive, giving human being, but it was when my masculinity was triggered or, um, confronted with, and my ego was confronted with, then I was a completely different person. And that's the moment when I said, enough is enough. I need to learn more about who I am, why I'm this way, and how I can move forward. Well, you're certainly not alone. I, I think any guy listening can identify with this sort of strain of like animalistic um, mm -hmm. masculinity that we all, it's a cultural thing. It, it's it's upbringing. It's, it's so many factors that go into it of like, this is how you're supposed to react if if someone questions you. And, and I think that women know it too. I mean, um, 
not so much that that they go through this um, in their own way, but they know they 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 sense it in the men that are in their lives. So it, it's a really fundamental question of of human psychology of why is this? In in your journey, you found what you describe as um, masks of masculinity that men tend to wear, which we'll go through here all of them in a minute. But what what I guess I, I first want to ask is. From what you found, why? Why are men stuck behind these various masks? Well, I think, one, they, pr- they protect men. They, men feel comfortable with them. They feel justified by them. And they've also, these masks have helped us and men get to certain places in our life. So they're con- confirming things that are working for us. And, um, you know, the masks are sometimes things that work for us and sometimes things that don't work for us. But when we continue to put them on as a something that we're not aware of that just happens naturally and it continues to hurt us and hurt others around us, then that's when it's not supporting our growth or supporting humanity and moving forward in a positive way. So that's why it's important to recognize the mask that we wear. And there's, you know, we're going to be talking about these masks here in a second, but um, these masks that I wear that are kind of my primary, primary masks, they may never go away. You know, I may never be this elevated human being. That's like a spiritually, um, never upset or never frustrated or, uh, never hurt emotionally. And I'm probably always going to have them at some point, but I want to be so aware of it when I put it on that I can take a moment, take a breath, take a step back and reconnect to my vision of what I want to be in the world, who I want to be and how I want to make an impact. So I think first is being aware of the masks that we wear and and then why we've been defined in wearing that and why it's so easy for us to put that on quickly in a moment's time when we're triggered. Uh, so for me, for me, it was a lot of reflection back to why, what these masks are, and then why I started putting it on. Well, we've got a full audience today, so I, I, I don't want to totally um, take it out of the of, of a realm that applies to women. I, I think yes. you would you would agree that women experience sort of a similar routine of putting oh, on sure. this facade every day, right? Oh, I mean, women are putting on masks just as much as men. I mean, that's a whole other book, a whole other conversation. But women, you know, feel like they need to be perfect at work to rise above men's because of their inequality issues there. They feel like they need to be perfect with their kids. They feel like they need to look perfect all the time for their partner. They feel like they need to be good at home, at work, in the bedroom, uh, you know, at their church, whatever it is, they have to always feel like they're on and that's exhausting. And that's a mask as well. And so I think it's, you know, it's reconnecting the fact that we're all human beings and that we're not perfect and that it's okay to, not have to put a mask on like we are in every situation in our life. And I think that's what it comes down to. So the point behind these, if uh, if I'm reading you correctly, is to kind of, it's to protect yourself. It's insulation. And it's also Absolutely. like projecting uh, this persona that people expect based on societal, cultural things. Um, obviously, Men wear different masks at different times. You went through the sort of the list of, of characters mm. that women are expected to play. But what are some of them that um, men are expected um, wrongly, I think, um, to, to wear? Yeah, the first one that I think I hear a lot from women is that men never show emotion, that they're very stoic and – um, they're very tough. They're very emotionless, and or they suppress the emotions. Again, I'm speaking in general terms here, so this isn't for every man. But that some men uh, put a wall up between themselves and the world. You can never really get inside to understand who they are um, because they're so stoic. They wear a stoic mask, and that showing vulnerability is weakness. And if you're if you're vulnerable, then you're a weak, soft. You know, I could use many other words that. I heard growing up in sports teams, type of a man. And no man wants to feel threatened that they are weak or soft or any of these other words that they're called, uh, you know, growing up. And so men start to put on this stoic mask so that they're not called these things to protect themselves, to show others that they are, in fact, 
strong enough. They can handle any of the pressure, any of the stress. They're there. They're rock solid. They're not going to waver. It's because they're emotionless and they don't express it. And I think that's, um, you know, one of the causes to men commit more suicides than, than women. Men are more depressed than women. Uh, men, uh, one in six men, uh, have been sexually abused, but rarely ever talk about it because they don't feel like they can express or communicate these things that happen. So I think when men hold back, when, when any human beings hold back their emotions or their feelings or their thoughts, it starts to materialize in the body or in the mind in a negative way. And then it comes out through different things that are not pretty and uh, hurt men and hurt women. So the first thing is, you know, and, and more generally, women express and communicate feelings, thoughts, fears more and um, are less depressed and, uh, and, and commit less suicides. Because when we are able to feel like we can communicate, we're able to feel like someone gets us, like someone is listening to us, like we have support. When we can't do that, it's like we're alone. We're isolated. And that causes a lot of these challenges for men is this isolation in their inner world. And they've got to take off the stoic mask in order to move forward. Is there one of these masks that maybe you felt uh, more heavily? <clears throat> I mean, the athlete mask, the aggression mask uh, for me, you know, growing up, I, there was a moment, I'll give you an instance, when, when I was uh, in fourth grade, when I went out into the playground recess uh, right before lunch or after lunch, whenever it was, and our teacher had us play a, a, a class dodgeball game. So there was probably, I don't know, it's called 40 kids in the class, 20, 20 boys, 20 girls. <clears throat> and he had two, two guys be kind of like the captains, like picking teams, like one, one person at a time. Right. And so I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm a pretty good athlete. Like I think I would be one of the first picked. And so one of the boys picks a guy and another boy, uh, the other captain picks another boy and they go back and forth picking b one boy at a time. And it comes down to the last two boys and I'm already emotionally upset, feeling hurt, feeling like, you know, I'm, I'm being picked on. Um, and it's down to me and one other boy and they, the, the picker chose the other boy. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm the next one to go. Right. I'm kind of like, oh, this sucks. I'm, you know, I guess I'm the last guy I chosen. Um, and then the captain chooses a girl before me. And then they go and choose another girl and goes on and on and on until everyone was chosen. And, and I was just the last pick by default. So I wasn't even chosen. It was just like, okay, you're on that last picking team. And I remember being so hurt and upset in that moment I mean, I went out there with a, a rage and just like dominated in this dodgeball game because I was so upset, right? And then I made the decision right there. I was like, never again will I be picked last in sports because of this feeling of not being good enough, of not being accepted by my peers, of all these things that were coming up for me. I, I decided that I will never be the last picked person. And my goal would be always to be the first picked person because that's where I got my worth from being picked or being needed on a team. And so every day after that moment, I was at uh, the gym playing basketball, lifting weights from after school, bell rang until like eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night for years and became, you know, what I thought to be a great athlete in high school and, and in college. And that became my mission in life to be a great athlete and to prove to others that I was capable and worthy and quote unquote man enough to be in that position of desire to be on a team. And again, that was just one example of me needing to define myself as this athlete, me needing to train throughout my entire you know childhood to, to say, this is who I am. I'm, I'm going to be a great athlete. And it's crazy how one little instance or multiple small instances or some things that people say or do growing up can affect the trajectory of our entire life and our makeup. And um, so for me, it was the athlete mask and the aggression mask because I felt so 
hurt and picked on and kind of bullied in that moment. And it wasn't just that moment. I mean, I struggled with uh, learning disabilities in school. So I was always in the special needs classes and made fun of. I was, um, you know, the tallest kid in class and just kind of like gangly and goofy looking. And I really just didn't have many friends in general. So it was just a number of things growing up that made me driven to be an athlete, great athlete and have this aggression mask. When anyone some tried to pick on me, it was just like, I'm going to be aggressive and no one's going to hurt me. So I wore kind of those two masks the most, the athlete mask and the aggression mask. And, um, that was kind of, uh, what drove me early on. Someone may be listening to this and thinking, what's so wrong with, um, a, a societal norm that leads you to be more healthy or something like that. But, but it's so interesting to me that athlete and aggression are so closely tied because really sports are, uh, a fairly recent human interest, right? 200 years ago, nobody nobody was really playing sports. There wasn't time for sports. It goes back to like warrior culture. I get, yeah, I get the sense. Exactly. And yeah. that's, that's how aggression and athleticism are so closely tied. Exactly. It is. I mean, there's, uh, there's not many, I guess, male athletes that are like just this loving, calm, cool, collected. There are some you know, I think of like Kawhi Leonard, I never see him get mad or really upset in a basketball game. And he's one of the best in the NBA, but I feel like in general, most people are like, they're fighting when they're competing. You know, when it's a sport, it's like, it's a battle to the death, right? It's kind of like mm-hmm. that energy. And I think the ones that can really elevate their mind and be so calm and neutral in their, you know, <sighs> aggression, those are the ones that seem to be elevated and, um, and continue to stay on top and have a sustained um, career, I guess. So let's talk over a few more of these. Um, sh- what about the uh, the stoic mask? I think that you've said that's sort of the most common one. It's based it's based on this idea that we should be uh, invulnerable and tough. Emotions are managed; they're suppressed. Nothing gets to us. So, what's the basis of this, and and why does it seem to be uh, one of the more common? I think it's just, again, growing up when, um, when, when kids show emotion, when they, when they're constantly teased for crying or saying, what are you going to do? You're going to cry. And then they're made fun of constantly. It puts people in this defense mechanism. No, I'm not going to cry. I'm going to be strong enough. You're not going to make fun of me for showing emotion because that doesn't feel good when my peers make fun of me. So therefore I'm going to be emotionless. I'm going to be strong when anything hurts me. No one's going to see it. Whenever I knock down, I'm going to get back up like it didn't hurt, and I'm not going to show emotion. And that translates for the rest of our lives until we learn how to communicate and understand how to be flexible in that emotion. I think another mask that's interesting to think about is the material mask and the sexual mask. You know, I think men in general feel like their worth is based on how much money they have in their bank account or how nice of a car they drive or how big of a home they can buy or the watch that they wear or the suit that they have. It's based on the material things in their lives. And why is it based on that? Because they're rewarded when they, you know, when they see other people, other men, maybe they're heroes or people they look up to who have money, who have nice things, and they see that they have a great lifestyle, or maybe they get the girl that they always wanted, or maybe they have something they didn't want. And men become driven to make money and be materialistic in order to achieve the results that they want. It's a, a sign of their worth is how much they have in their bank account. Um, and then I would say the sexual mask, you know, in, in locker rooms in when you're hanging out with guys, uh, growing up when the, all the conversations around girls and how many girls you hooked up with and the girls you, that want you and what you did with those girls. And you start to get worth from the other boys in, you know, middle school, high school, college, whatever. And you start to get acknowledgement for how cool you are or how, uh, you know, desirable that is. You start to put your worth in your sexuality, in how many girls you can be with and brag about, in the conquest, and as opposed to having intimacy and being in a relationship and building a foundation with a partner, 
Um, and people will continue to shy away from taking off that mask because they're getting validation. So all these masks give men validation, whether it's material mask, the sexual mask, the athlete mask, you know, there's the Joker mask, which is, uh, the man who has a sense of humor. He's going to be the one that everyone wants to be around. He's going to be the one that, uh, that makes anyone laugh and has worth in his humor. But sometimes when men are always leading with humor, they never know how to be loving and supportive and listen and just be in the emotion of a vulnerable moment or when something bad happens. If you always reflect back to humor, it's hard to really connect as a human being to people who are going through something else. So all these things, again, in some ways support us and drive us forward and, and, and help us in a lot of ways. But if it's something we are constantly leading with and not aware of, then they can be detrimental to our relationships. What are some of the benefits then that await if we can drop these masks? I think it's, again, the, the inner world benefits and connecting to others in our lives on a deeper level, which for me, the most powerful thing that we can create in the world is vulnerability with one another, because that's when all the walls are dropped. And that's when we fully feel like we can understand the person in another, in, in other shoes. And that's when we build the most powerful bond between human beings is when there is vulnerability. Think about it. When you just meet someone for the first time at a networking event and you all you ask them is, what do you do? And, uh, you know, where's your, what's your title at your work? And, how big's your company? And you're just talking about surface level things. You have a surface level relationship. It's transactional. It's focused on results of what the other person can do for you or how you could partner or what they can do to promote you. And that's the level of your relationship. It's impossible to have a, a deeper relationship unless you allow yourselves to go a little bit deeper. And that comes from asking the right questions that comes from being willing to share openly. Now I'm not saying in every conversation we need to be crying and talking about the worst things that have happened in our lives and how sad everything is. It's not about that. It's about being real, open and honest conversations with humans. And of course there's a time and a place for discernment and, you know, timing of when to say certain things and how to say them and understanding the people you're connecting with and all these different things that we get to learn how to do. But I know when I started opening up about the most vulnerable, scary moments of my, my life that I've been through, I held on to things for, for decades that no one ever knew about me because I was so ashamed of things that had happened when I was a kid. When I finally started to open up, to my siblings and my parents and, and close friends about things that I was ashamed of and afraid that if anyone ever knew about me, that they would never love me again. When I finally started to open up about it, I created deeper connections and relationships with each person by opening up. And because they and all these individuals I opened it up to, they started sharing things to me about things I never knew about them. And we created this level of respect and trust and community and connection that was never available before because we were playing life at a surfacey level. So when we finally start to open up in ways that aren't on a surface level, we can have the most meaningful relationships, which again, connect humanity. You know, it's so funny that the one thing that the detrimental effect that all of these seem to have in common to me is that they all close us off from opportunities that come up. Right. Mm -hmm. um, another one that I know you you talk about is the know it all mask. And, and women definitely hate this way. There's even the <laughs> term for um, mansplaining. Yep. Um, and when you wear the know it all mask, if you're forced to always have the answer, well, no one always has the answer. But if you're wearing that mask, you're missing out on perspective or ideas from someone who does know the answer. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the thing. Again, the know-it-all mask is, listen, I, I, I've done this many times where I just keep rambling and rambling and trying to be right and trying to have the answers as opposed to just listening and having an open conversation and having healthy, you know, debate as opposed to being like, no, I'm right. You're wrong. And I think it's, we, 
when our manhood or our intelligence is questioned and we don't know how to handle it, we just continue to, again, mansplain or go into like how smart we are or, well, I had this degree and you didn't have this, so why would you know the answer type of deflecting. And I think um, it's just important to continue to be open, be open as best we can. doesn't mean that we, we need to be wrong all the time or anything like that, but just be open and be aware. You know, maybe there's a different perspective or someone has a different answer that is going to be supportive in this specific situation. And if not, then we agree to disagree and move forward as opposed to beating each other to, a, to a intel, intellectual death. And I think that's the challenge. You do a lot of listening for your podcast. Um, yes. Of course, the School of Greatness. You have men on. You have women on. Um, what what can men learn about vulnerability, um, and and just in general, what what can men learn from women that women seem to do so much better than us? Yeah, I mean, well, what can men learn about vulnerability? First off, um, they can finally start to heal internal wounds and forgive when when we start to become vulnerable. It's when we allow ourselves to open up for healing. When we constantly have something, a layer over a wound, uh, it's never going to be able to fully heal. And the healing may take for the rest of your life. But if we don't allow ourselves to address the things that have been hurting us in our lives or have been affecting us or have been confusing us or holding us back from achieving what we want, then we're always going to be struggling with that wound. So for me, vulnerability sheds light on a wound that needs healing. And the more we address it and openly talk about it, the less the pain controls and consumes our inner world as men and allows us to heal, move forward, and be a more supportive human with humanity. And I think that's the key as opposed to seeing how we can fight and win at everything at all costs. It's, it's not an effective way to lead in the world. And I really believe the the definition of masculinity is, um, someone who lives in service to humanity and to others. And I think I'm, I'm all for standing for what you believe in and, you know, being committed to your vision and committed to your dream But if it's at the expense and cost of so much pain and suffering where we can't find a way to lift everyone up and and support others in the process, then we need to reevaluate what our vision is. So I think just about everybody listening to us today can identify with um, some of these things that we're talking about. And maybe they want to make a change. But deep down, you have the feeling, everyone should have the feeling um, and not underestimate it of how hard this this will really be. <laughs> it, it, these are some deep, uh, deep factors in our psyche that it's a lifelong process for, for how to overcome these masks that we all wear. And so um, that, that being said, I, I wonder just where do you start? What is the first step? You know, it's, it's going to be one of the hardest journeys of every man's life is taking off the mask. And many of us have, have worn our masks for so long that we're not even sure what's actually underneath it anymore. We've lost track of where something begins and where it ends and who we really are because we've been living with a mask on daily. And it's just a habit now. So it's going to be one of the most challenging journeys of every man's life, in my opinion, if they haven't already been aware of this and if they're not already in that process. For me, It was when I was 30, when I finally started to be like, wow, my entire life, I've been living from a place of I'm right and everyone else is wrong. It's a recognition. Yeah. I was, I was living in a place of, I need to win and everyone else needs to lose at all costs. I need to be right. They need to be wrong. I need to win. If I don't win, that means I'm a loser. And if I'm a loser, then no one's going to love me. And so I need to become bigger, faster, stronger, more aggressive, and more focused than ever to win at all costs. And the amount of relationships that I hurt and suffering and pain and frustration 
with, you know, others and myself, I wasn't even aware of fully until this recognition happened. So the first key is to be aware and to go through the process of like, huh, what mask do I wear? And the challenge is if you would ask me if I wore a mask when I was 25, I'd have been like, no, I'm good. Like all this stuff, everything I'm doing is working for me. So get off my back. You know, I'd have been like, don't try to tell me I need to work on myself. Like I have all the answers. That's because my ego was so much stronger than my willingness to be open. And so it's going to be the the biggest challenge for some men. It's going to be the biggest you know fight they ever face is facing themselves and their own ego. And um, it can be very challenging to break through that if you're um, another man, another woman who's trying to break through for someone that you love who's wearing a mask, it's going to be challenging. And that's why coming from a place of love, embracing all the, the, the powerful things, the positive things about that person is the best way to lead with this conversation. If you want to address it with someone, uh, again, acknowledging first the good in someone, as opposed to saying, you're wrong, you're bad, you need to stop doing this. That's not going to help a man that's wearing masks. What's going to be supportive in the process, which may be a long process, is acknowledgement, is lifting the man up, elevating the man for the good that he does do in the world and seeing all the good first. And then, and then starting to have a loving, open conversation with ways you believe that things he's doing is, is hurting him from moving forward towards his vision, towards who he wants to be, how he wants to be remembered, um, how he wants to make an impact on people. And I think it's going to be a process unless the man is willing to open up and recognize, oh, something's off. I need support. I need to change. I need to evolve. I need to learn. It's going to be a journey for a lot of men and a lot of men supporting those men and women supporting those men. Well, I am so glad that we had you on today because everybody listening knows exactly what we're talking about. They, right. they're, they're aware. They, they're all saying to themselves, yeah, yeah, that's kind of me. So. <laughs> Um, it, it's just a great jumping off point, and, and I encourage anyone to to read The Mask of Masculinity. Women, too. Um, before we let you go, I have a few more questions that we like to ask everyone who joins uh, us for Success Talks. A little, little quick, uh, fun ones. Let's do it. If you could choose one superpower, which superpower would you choose? Hmm. I don't know if I've ever thought of this, actually. Um <laughs> You could just say fly and no one will, <laughs> no one will doubt you. I think it's, um, for me, it would be to impact, having the ability to impact every human being on the planet in every moment. You've interviewed a lot of people over the years. What is the most life changing thought that one of them has shared with you? That's like the most impossible thing to answer <laughs> because they've all share life changing thoughts. Um, I think it's more the way of being as opposed to an answer that someone's given me. It's their way of being that a number of people have shown to me from people like Tony Robbins to um, Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer to Wim Hof, one of the top breathing performance masters in the world to uh, Ray Lewis, you know, Super Bowl champion to, Tim Ferriss uh, to Liz Gilbert, all these individuals have this energy, this way of being that is so clear on what they want to create in the world and the impact they want to have with their vision. Again, it's more of an energy and a way of being than something someone says. How do you define success? For me, it's about two things. Pursuing the dreams that we have within us, being on that pursuit, it's a lifelong uh, journey, and making the maximum impact on the most people we can around us in that pursuit. You don't even need superpowers necessarily. <laughs> exactly. Lewis, enjoyed it so much. Thanks for joining Success Talks. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. I really enjoyed my talk with Lewis House. His book may be focused on the male population, but the lessons are the same across the board for anyone who is willing to listen. For example, Lewis talked about how he and most of us live in two worlds, the one people see 
and the one only we see, our inner world. Each of us can relate to that, I think. We rarely let everyone around us know our innermost thoughts and feelings. Some of us hold this in more than others. But what is wrong with being vulnerable sometimes? Why are we so afraid of vulnerability? We use masks like the ones Lewis talked about to protect ourselves. But from what? From getting hurt, ridiculed? Sure, those are not pleasant. But we can't protect ourselves 24-7. Something or someone will break through eventually and we will be even more hurt and emotionally scarred because we aren't properly prepared for it. Which brings me to the next point that Lewis shared, and that is the number one most important thing we can be is self-aware. We need to know what masks we're wearing and why we're wearing them. Without knowing this, we can't start to remove them and be more open and welcoming to those around us. Masks, no matter what you think, are ultimately detrimental to our relationships and our overall success. They will always hold us back, so we must work on removing them some of the time, if not all the time, in order to be truly successful. Opening up like that, removing the mask, creates respect, trust, community, connection, and of course, meaningful relationships. So ask yourself, what masks are you wearing and why? Remember, we are all human, we aren't perfect, and it's okay to not put a mask on in every situation in our lives. That's hard to hear, right? I know, trust me. But the more open we are, the better our lives can be. The more we'll learn about ourselves and the more open we are for success. That brings this month's success talks to a close. I hope you have heard a few ideas to help you improve your life. If you take away nothing else from this podcast, start by picking one single thing you're grateful for. Remind yourself of that one thing daily. You'll see, living with a grateful mindset could be the key to unlocking that door to your future success. Email us. We want to hear what you're grateful for. Send your thoughts of gratitude to us at you at success, Y-O-U at success.com. We want to know. I can wholeheartedly say that we are grateful for you. You are our support, our strength, and our reason for creating all this great content each and every month. We need you and your success stories to keep us going. So thank you for you and keep them coming. Now, you know by now that our goal is to always bring you the very best ideas from experts and forward thinkers so that you can learn and grow in your life and work. If you enjoy Success Talks and all it has to offer to help you grow, check out Success Accelerator. It's our new training program that is a one-stop shop for taking your life to the next level. It's a subscription platform that comes loaded with exclusive lessons from mentors like Brendan Burchard, Dave Ramsey, Dr. Daniel Amen, Tom Bilyeu, Carrie Wilkerson, and more. Visit success.com slash accelerator to sign up and get access for seven days completely free. And don't forget about our other podcast, Success Insider, where Shelby and I focus on a specific personal growth topic each week and give you an inside look at the goings-on here at Success Magazine. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating and be sure to catch more great success talks each week. It's free on iTunes, Stitcher, success.com, and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thanks for listening to Success Talks. Catch every Success Talks via iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast streaming app. And of course, you can always find each talk and the full audio at success.com slash success talks. Stream and download your favorite talks today. And while you're there, sign up to receive the free newsletter, Inside Success, to get great ideas, inspiration, and quotes delivered to your inbox every week. Success Magazine Audio, copyright 2017 by Success. All rights reserved.